Uh, hi again at the Subversive Festival. Uh, it is my great honor to present uh, Tariq Ali today. Uh, he's our regular and old and traditional guest and comrade, so I don't think we need to describe who he is. Actually, today something very funny happened. Tariq was walking on the streets of Zagreb, and a cab, a tax taxi, stopped over, and the cab driver opened the window and said, Oh, Tariq, hello. So... <laughs> So if, if even the taxi drivers in Zagreb know who Tariq is, uh, I think you probably this room also knows who Tariq is. If you don't know, you can buy his book, Obama Syndrome, <laughs> which is... <laughs> or you can Google, of course. Uh, so I won't take the floor anymore. Uh, after the lecture, uh, as always, we will have a Q&A, an opportunity for questions of the audience. Tarek, thanks again, again for coming. The title of the lecture is The Rotten Heart of Europe. Um, thank you. What is very good to... Uh, it, it, it's really good to be in Zagreb again. And what is especially good... Uh, is to see that there is now a young generation uh, which is questioning and which is challenging the so-called truths that have been established over the last 15, 20 years. Because I am one of those old-fashioned people who believe that history is very important and you can't run away from it for too long. It always comes up on you. Uh, and so it's better to talk a bit about history. Otherwise, you don't understand anything that's going on, which is why it's, it's important always to understand and learn from the past its mistakes and also some of its good sides. Now, uh, it's become almost unnecessary to speak about Europe today because all the mythologies that were created about Europe have disappeared very quickly and are disappearing <clears throat> even as we speak. The last news we had from Athens is that the old decaying president of that republic has failed to get a pro-Euro government going in that country. So there will be new elections in Greece in June. And the opinion polls from the latest, I spoke to people in Athens today, the opinion polls from Greece are very interesting. <clears throat> at the moment, Syriza, the new left party, is at the top, getting more votes than new democracy. Uh, the fascists of the new dawn are down. PASOK is further down, new democracy is down. So the Development since the last elections in Greece has been very interesting. And so we shall see, and I will return to this subject. But before that, I want to talk a bit about the European idea, what it was, how it developed, and how it's reached the stage it has now. And I think it's important to stress that there were two visions of Europe, almost from the beginning. One was expressed by the uh, um, conservative economist Hayek, who, didn't write, who wasn't an important figure at the time, but wrote that the only Europe that should be created is an economic union. The rest was pure fantasy, and this should be a union of the free market. That was not the dominant idea when Europe was created. The dominant idea was that put forward by... Uh, Jean Monnet, accepted by uh, Charles de Gaulle later on, defended at that time by many within the European ruling elites, and that was essentially a core Europe, a, f a federal Europe, a political Europe, which could be an independent entity in the world that existed at that time, the world of the Cold War. And what they were very specific about, especially the French, but surprisingly to a certain extent, even the Germans, that this Europe should not be engaged directly in the battles of the Cold War, 
and it should not be aligned and tied to the United States of America. Being aligned to the Soviet Union was not even a, an issue, but it should not be. In other words, the model they had of Europe was not unlike the Yugoslav model that existed in this region at the time of a non-aligned country, a country which refused to take part in the Cold War or support one bloc against the other, but which carved out a different space, an independent space in the world. And that was not exactly in the same way, but in a similar analogous way, the desire of the early founders of the European movement and the European idea. So uh, Charles de Gaulle, who of course was an intelligent French nationalist, but also a European in that sense, saw that this would be the only way to move forward with an independent Europe. But the Europe which ultimately we got was not the Gaullist idea of Europe or Monet's idea of Europe, but the idea which finally gained currency was Margaret Thatcher's Europe. An idea of Europe of the bankers, Europe of the markets, and this idea became extremely dominant in the 80s and of course reached fruition in the 90s. And the result we can see, you know, till 2000, all the ideologues of Europe were essentially boasting. If you read the stuff they write now, it appears very shallow. They were not in favor of too much democracy within the European institutions. Many of these ideologues went crazy when the French the Irish and the Dutch rejected the European Constitution. And the main reason it was rejected by the French was because inscribed in the Constitution was a sentence which made neoliberal capitalist economic policies the dominant and the only acceptable systemic policy. And the French government made a mistake in sending a copy of this constitution to every single household in France. Not that many people could read it or wanted to read it because it's a very boring document, but people campaigning against it made sure they explained it to the French. That was the most interesting debate in Europe, the debate that took place in France because it involved large numbers of people, which is why the referendum in France on the European Constitution the, the people voting no won. The Irish voted no. The Dutch voted no. At this point, the European elite panicked and cancelled all other referendums. The Germans weren't allowed a referendum. The British weren't allowed a referendum because they were fearful that exactly the same thing would happen again. So much for democracy. And what was the result of these referendums? The, re uh, the result was that the the, the uh, will of the people, if you like, on this particular issue was ignored. And they pushed through uh, a, a new document which was more or less exactly the same. So there has been, in this type of European Union, expanded essentially a union of markets from the beginning, a very conscious attempt to keep the democracy and the democratic side of it very limited. All the key decisions are not made by the elected European Parliament, which is why so few people vote for it. It's a joke. You know, a, a minority of the electorate votes for European Parliament elections and because people know it doesn't matter. Like many countries which vote to join uh, the union, like you did not so long ago, only 43% of the electorate came out and voted. Because they knew that the elites would push it through whatever happened, didn't much matter, there were no alternatives, what to do, but a majority didn't vote, if, if one looks at it in that particular uh, uh, form. But this European Union then boosted itself and boasted. It was incredibly narcissistic. This is the way to the future. Europe is showing the future to the world. 
uh, very arrogant even towards the Americans in the sense that we can show a better capitalist future to the world than the United States can do. And that has now come to an end, that particular period. I don't want to bore you. I could quote to you statements from British ideologues, from German philosophers like Jürgen Habermas, the most distinguished of Germany's philosophers, completely tied to the European elites and defending them to the hilt and boasting about them. So that was... The, the, and whereas when you look, even before the crisis, you know, there's a pre-crisis Europe and a post-crisis Europe. Even before the crisis, the figures are very interesting. At 2000 at the Lisbon summit, they promised to create within 10 years the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world. It was a post. They couldn't uh, uh, do it. And the growth rate of the EU lagged well behind that of the United States and China. It's quite an interesting figure, this, that two-fifths of all American scientists, two-fifths, that is 400,000 scientists were born in, the, in Europe. Why do they go there if Europe is so dynamic? The labor, cheap labor in China, of course, you know that you can't blame Europe for. That's just a fact at the moment that the average wage in China is 20 times lower than the average wage in most of Europe. That also clearly affected the capacity of the European economies. And then the German economy recovered, incidentally, not so much by export-oriented, uh, 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 by producing an export-oriented economy, which played its part, but by repressing wage levels in Germany for seven or eight years, much more than France and Britain and other countries. And that repression of the German wage level was actually carried out by threatening them with cheap Eastern European labor saying we can get Slovaks to do the same thing for half the price you want us to go there, <clears throat> threatening we can get all our clothes washed and hotel clothes washed and medical sheets washed in Poland just across the border for half the price you charge. You want us to do that? So this constant fear and blackmail got the unions scared and they repressed wages. German wages were very severely repressed. Uh, and that is also a basis of uh, the, the development of the German economy, not just exports. It's important to remember this. Um, and then you look at what was the foreign policy of this European Union. How was it different from that of the United States? That this had been their boast, we will create a new European policy which will appeal to the whole world. When it came to the crunch, at key moments in world history over the last 25 years, the European Union capitulated time and time again. The only time it acted independently of the United States, unilaterally it made a huge error, in my opinion. That was when Helmut Kohl unilaterally recognized Slovene independence without consulting anyone else in Europe, leave alone the other parts of Yugoslavia, and effectively triggered, in my opinion, the main external factor of the breakup. There were internal factors, there were economic factors, the IMF, but the main external factor was German unilateralism in relation to breaking up Yugoslavia. Had they not done that, had they thought, discussed with others, discussed with people within Yug the former Yugoslavia, there were other alternatives open to what finally happened. A bitter conflict, the emergence of small nationalisms, in the worst possible sense of the word, balkanization. That was not necessary. It was not genetic. It was not preordained. It was the result of concrete political and economic decisions which then impacted internally and created horrors. 
you know, we know these horrors. We don't need to talk about them, especially to an audience uh, such as this. But it wasn't automatic. And the breakup, in my opinion, has been a disaster story. It's not been a good thing. And as the crisis deepens, it will be felt more. So that was the only time that the, a big state in the European Union made a unilateral decision. After that, they never tried uh, again. This blackmailing of Greece not to quit the Eurozone is a common, it's not just the uh, Germans who are saying it, it's the, uh, Sarkozy was certainly saying it while he was in uh, power, backed by the British government. All the three big powers of the European Union were trying to put pressure on Greece, don't do it. And it was foolish, as we will see uh, in a very short space of time now after the new elections. It's very interesting that the debate in Germany is within the official media is more advanced than the debate on Greece, uh, in, in the Greek media, in which there's an atmosphere of fear created by the Greek media, warning Greeks, what will happen to you if you quit the hallowed Eurozone, as if the Euro has existed forever, or as if they, nothing they can do. Interestingly, last week's De Spiegel had a long text telling the Greek people it's in your interest to quit the Eurozone. Don't listen to our politicians. And the IMF, which is hardly a radical organization, has said that there will be two years of turmoil, but after that the Greek economy will be stronger than it is now if it quits the Euro. That's the IMF position. So this you know, sacred status given to, 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 to the euro is ridiculous because what Greece needs desperately at the moment is devaluation, like Spain, like Portugal, and you can't do it with this present system in force where the European Central Bank is less flexible than the Federal Reserve in the United States, less flexible in what it permits and what it doesn't permit. If you look at European Union's foreign policy in relation to the recent wars, it has completely backed the United States, with the exception of Iraq, where they didn't support the war, but the minute Iraq had been occupied, the Germans and the French voted for the UN resolution um, in which, uh, 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 you know, accepting the occupation regime and collaborating with it fully. So even that was a very short-lived affair. And in Afghanistan, you know there are many countries and many soldiers involved in trying to win a war which is completely unwinnable. But let's leave the wars in these countries aside for a minute. We can return to it if you want. What, in my view, has been utterly appalling and atrocious is the way in which the European elites accepted to and were dragooned into very quickly without any opposition of participating in the imprisonment and arrest of citizens and sending them to torture chambers. That happened in Germany under the you know, brilliant foreign ministership of Joska Fischer, who is worshipped as a great European statesman. He presided over that in Germany. And there were German citizens of Lebanese and Turkish origin picked up in different parts of the world, sent to Guantanamo, who later on had to be released, not just because there was no evidence against them, but they had arrested the wrong people and tortured them. And they were tortured on planes coming from uh, Asia and then sent back to be tortured in other places. The Polish at least said, no, no, we won't send them anywhere else. We'll build our own torture chambers to torture them. They're always original, the Poles, in some way or the other. <laughs> the Croatian government collaborated with that. Algerians were taken out of Tuzla. No one knows whether they were innocent or guilty. No one knows because no one cares handed over, sent either to be tortured in Afghanistan or the other countries where they used to be sent to be tortured was Egypt, Jordan, Pakistan, 
torture centers where the people were experts in torturing. They had been, after all, doing it for 30 years to their own people. So a few guests who are sent by the United States to be tortured, it's not a problem at all. And one of the people being tortured in Egypt, just let me remind you of this, he was being tortured and he suddenly, you know, came to consciousness again and the guy who was torturing him was the vice president of the country who later became vice president, Suleiman, the head of the secret police and who loved torture himself. He said, why should ordinary people do it? I will show them how to do it. This is the guy the United States wanted to replace Mubarak with and who, wa who wanted to be a presidential candidate, but it became too much of a scandal. The generals had to say it would be a scandal if a torturer. Even the generals in Egypt recognized that. <clears throat> and the Europeans collaborated with this. So where is all this talk of human rights and norms when there is full and complete collaboration with a crazy policy which was called the war on terror. A war on terror can never be fought precisely because terrorists are not, a, not state actors. They are groups of individual, groups of people who decide to carry out dramatic acts to shake public consciousness. They are wrong in my opinion. I don't agree with them tactically at all, but it's foolish to invade and occupy countries to defeat them, and now we know they can't defeat them. Osama bin Laden, who was on top of the most wanted terror terrorist list, was living happily in Pakistan in a safe house provided by Pakistani intelligence just near the military academy. Ten years he was living there. It took. Finally, they found him. And then instead of trying him, they executed him. And America saw this on the screens, and kids ran out onto the streets saying, we got him, we got him, as if they were extras in a bad Hollywood movie. And there is a Hollywood movie being prepared, which will probably be shown in uh, November or December to aid the re-election of the president. This is a world we live in. There are no norms in this world, despite all the talk of norms and the talk of human rights. And to Europe's eternal shame, it collaborated with all this. Some were worse collaborators than others, but mostly all of Europe collaborated. The elites, of course. The citizens didn't even know about it, because citizens in Europe are by and large regarded as children who should stay at home, do their duty, come out and vote once every five years for agreed parties, and then go back home, watch television, go shopping, even if they can't now afford to buy anything, at least go and look at the shops from the outside. And foreign policy and domestic policies conducted behind closed doors, by and large, not in front of the children. We don't want to get them too upset. But that system now is breaking down. And what has broken it down has been the crisis of 2008. What was this a crisis of? It was a crisis of the economic system, which we call neoliberalism, but which, uh, as Zizek and I were discussing a few days ago, is capitalism. It's the current phase of capitalism. And this system collapsed in 2008. And with it should have collapsed the entire set of policies that flow from it. Privatizations, deregulation, which your Croatian government is still going ahead with as if it's fast asleep. It did it to some factories here in Braj not so long ago doesn't realize that that system is finished. You can't carry on functioning like that anymore. But those who make policy in Europe and the United States haven't woken up. And one reason they hadn't woken up up till now because there had been very few upheavals from below. But now with new movements developing and new movements arising, uh, they are forced to take notice. They can't totally ignore that the changes, the sort of dramatic explosion of the center in Greece, uh, 
is a result of general strikes, you know, quarter of 300,000 people marching and laying siege to parliament in Athens in a country of 10 million people, demonstrations in Greek cities large and small, demonstrations in villages. That is what has created the mood and the atmosphere in which Syriza can rise and topple the two main parties. Because what this particular model, capitalist model, has encouraged, in my opinion, is an institutionalized depoliticization of the masses. And this has been carried out with a decreasing demo democracy and democratic accountability. So what we have had in many parts of the world the United States, it's been there for a long time, but in Europe it became very systemic too, is the political impact of this new capital has to create what I have defined as an extreme center. An extreme center which encompasses both center left and center right, who differ on cultural things, but on all the key things of the day, they tend to agree, as we have seen in Spain as we've seen in Greece, as we've seen in France, we will see what Hollande will do. I, I have to be honest, I'm glad Sarkozy was defeated. I'm not totally optimistic, unless there are huge mass movements which push and push and push and push. So this extreme center has existed in European countries. Why do I call it extreme? It preaches austerity, it punishes its own people, it breaches civil liberties, it locks up people without trying them, and it is in favor, in most cases, of occupying countries. That's what it does. But what else is extremism? And this extreme center has cracked open in Greece. That's the first break. And there are possibilities in other countries, too, if people mobilize. I mean, the campaign of the left front in France um, was very effective, I thought. They, would have, they should have got more votes, uh, but people were scared of letting Sarkozy in, and many, many good people voted, uh, voted Hollande in the first round. But four million votes is not a bad score. It's not a bad score. And in other parts of Europe, too, new movements, new groups are developing, arising to challenge this. The Occupy movement, which started in the Arab world, <clears throat> spread to the United States, and is very strong in Spain, not so much in other European countries, is an interesting phenomenon. It's interesting because people are deciding that they can take their future in their own hands. But unless this public space, which is occupied, which is, after all, can only be symbolic, unless they move from this to occupying political space, and coming up with political alternatives, there will be a decline, in my view, of the movement. Already in Spain, the crowds are not so great as they were a year ago, because people also know that immediately after the big indagnado occupations in Spain, there was the election of a very right-wing government. And you can't just think about one and not the other. You have to think about how to use the strength of the movement, they have to think, in order to defeat the right and create a new space. Without that, it's very difficult, uh, uh, very difficult to move forward. Now, what is the outcome likely to be? What is the alternative? In my opinion, and I the alternative has to be some form of socialism, which actually challenges this system. Can't be done without that. You know, you can't have alternatives which constantly work within the within the dominant system. You, you, no one's going to allow you to. And the biggest 
problem here, and this is, you know, something we have to face and discuss, and we do it all the time, but we have to, we have to do it more and more publicly, that there is a direct relationship between the socialism that once existed, actually existing socialism, as the German thinker Rudolf Barrow once called it, which he didn't like, he didn't describe as socialism as he wanted, but what existed. There is a direct link between that and the weakness of a socialist alternative today. People don't want to return to that system for obvious uh, reasons. Economically, it was austere and backward, largely because of where it happened. The total output of those societies was constrained by scarcity. There was a low productivity of labor. Politically, most of those countries were dominated by authoritarian state apparatuses, which took away civic liberties, expropriated the rights of association and organization. Culturally, you had an official monopoly of the means of communication, a repressive regulation of ideas, an exaltation of the nation, and the bureaucracy became the master of all social life. Now, no one wants a return to that. However, there were other sides and aspects of these societies, which many people today all over Eastern Europe and Russia you encounter, who have memories of it, that however faulty and defective the system was for the reasons I've pointed out, you also had a crude equality of sorts in which people had the right to a free education, people had the right to a free health service, to very, very extensively subsidized housing, subsidized electricity, subsidized gas, water, etc. Now, if you look at today's world, these are not small things. So in a way, you can describe those societies that existed not as social democracy, but as social dictatorships. And the dictatorial sides of that was rejected by everyone. But the social sides we now miss. It can be much, much better than that. And I've, you know, never, even at the 80s and 90s, when many people were falling like, sort of, moving away from anything radical, like cotton floating in the air after a thunderstorm, it was always wrong, in my opinion, to ascribe all the faults of the old socialist countries and these systems as flowing from the ideas of Marx. How did they flow from the ideas of Marx? This became such a dominant theme to create the new societies that everything associated with the past was considered unacceptable. I mean, you know, what Marx argued in his writings, he never had a fully-fledged plan for socialist societies. But what he argued for, his expectation was that socialist societies would be based on the economics of abundance, not scarcity, which is why he thought that countries like Germany and Britain and France were the obvious candidates for socialism that the political order of these societies would be based on a radical popular sovereignty, that the producers of wealth, the actual people who produced wealth, would for the first time ever have the means of democratic self-government in factories, fields, municipalities, and assemblies that culture would be diverse and variegated, moving beyond all existing boundaries, beyond capital and beyond nation. That was the vision of Marx. Limited, because he never developed it, but very, very clear in his writings. And that is a vision worth fighting for, because we need it now. And you know, people say, ah, but we tried it and it failed. There are two responses to that. What you tried wasn't exactly that. 
It was something very different. But nonetheless, it was an attempt, and that attempt failed. So it failed once. How many times has capitalism failed in its history? 60, 70 times over the last 500 years? And people carry on. And this last failure <clears throat> is now proving expensive because it takes place at a time when you have had massive deindustrialization preceding it, where you have had financialization of a sort that could barely be predicted, and where mass unemployment now stares a majority of young people in most European countries in the face each day. And unless the left comes up with a vision which challenges this and which is prepared to take tough decisions, what happens? A vacuum is created. In this vacuum, people do all sorts of things. Some move to the extreme right. I mean, there are cases in Germany, by the way, of some of my friends from the old German SDS who are now ideologues for the ultra-German nationalist right, like Bernd Rabel. So it's not just, you know, you can't just blame ordinary people for moving in that direction. Many intellectuals have moved in that direction. And this right, which it now exists in most of Europe, in Hungary it takes a very peculiar shape and a very vicious shape because it's in power or virtually in power, but in, it exists in many other European countries. And you know, while it's, of course, we attack it and we fight it, and Mélenchon did this rather well in France recently when no other political parties were doing it, but you have to understand that the right appeals to workers and to unemployed, not primarily because of its racism. It does that, of course, which the extreme right has always done. The problem is the enemies within. In the 20s and 30s, they were Jews. Today, they are Muslims or immigrants from other parts of the world. Uh, as the uh, Greek fascists are today saying, let's cleanse Athens of all immigrants. They do all that. But the more serious right-wing, extreme right-wing parties also present a social and economic vision which is attractive to people because they attack the system, they attack the elites, they attack the way in which the system is organized to favor the rich, and that is a message which people haven't been getting till now from the center-left. Because what happened in Europe in the 90s, we know all about the collapse of communism. But with the collapse of communism was the collapse of social democracy, which was heavily dependent on communism and the existence of the Soviet Union in order to um, push through the reforms it did after the Second World War. And the collapse of social democracy has meant that no other mass parties have emerged which defend even a social democratic program, leave alone something more radical. Where this has happened has not been in Europe, but in South America, where parties have grown linked to large social movements, come to power, and then push through anti-capitalist reforms. They may not have gone far enough, but they have attempted to do something, and they have managed to maintain popular support with this program, which is why they have been denounced in the mainstream financial press, the Financial Times, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, etc., etc. They have done it. And what they have done, there is absolutely no reason why this cannot be, be, be done in Europe. But for that, people have to be active. People have to fight. Socialism, as defined by Marx, is going to be a long historical process. You know, disasters have taken place, repressions, deformations, we don't need to rehearse the millions of victims 
of the purges in the Soviet Union, the role of the secret police, we know all that. We have to say that this has nothing to do with socialism. These are huge tragedies which were man-made in the case of the purges in the Soviet Union or the unintended consequences of crazy policies in China under Mao which led to huge famines. That is something which one cannot accept, has to be denounced. But if you just stop at denunciation, you never get anywhere else. And that is all that happens ideologically within the domain of capitalist social relations and cultural relations today. A constant attack on an enemy which has already been defeated. They want to crush it and kill it forever. But that can't happen because as long as capitalism exists, as long as capitalism exists, there will be attempts by people to fight for a better system, whatever it's called. How can people give up when a system that is based largely on preserving the rights of the rich, and this has now become so clear that one doesn't need to stress it anymore. I mean, if you look, coming back to the crisis of 2008, the entire ideological thrust of this form of capitalism was the state is redundant, can't be allowed to do anything, certainly can't be allowed to help the poor, can't be allowed to intervene in the economy, mustn't own anything, everything should be privatized, and when their banks collapsed, the state, what did it do? They went to the state, please help us. And the elites went to the states, and trillions of dollars were poured in to sustain those very banks that had caused and created the crisis with the help of politicians. The politicians and bankers. You know, Lenin once said, let me shock you by mentioning his name. Lenin once said, and we used to think this was a very exaggerated phrase, that in the ultimate analysis, Bourgeois politics is little more than concentrated economics. It was not true when he said it, to be fair. It hasn't been exactly true for some time, but these days it feels very true that the symbiosis between the politics of the extreme center and big money and big corporations and big banks is so huge that democracy itself is under threat today. This notion that capitalism and democracy are happy bedfellows, it's not the case. There are things which they don't tolerate. Hence the fear and the pressure on the Greek people to not to accept the verdict they themselves have made. You were wrong. Hence the refusal to accept the votes in the French, Dutch, and Irish referendums. Hence when Papandreou in Greece, for the first time, the only thing he did in recent years which was sensible, he said, okay, you're putting these conditions on us. Let me organize a referendum. Let our people decide. He was called to Berlin, and Sarkozy and Merkel went for him, bullied him. How dare you suggest a referendum? How dare you do this in times of crisis? So... The way in which capitalism functions today is actually hollowing out the processes of democracy itself. And it's extremely important to recognize and realize this because we, we will soon have to start fighting for democratic rights very, very forcefully, as we do in the case of civil liberties and we are ignored completely ignored, saying that no one should be in prison without a trial. You have laws in most European countries where people can be locked up for years without a trial. There are people in Britain today who have been in prison for eight years without any trial. And in order to justify this, you have Islamophobia, 
they're terrorists, they're Muslims. Well, okay, prove them guilty then in a court of law. Doesn't happen. And people who think this doesn't affect them will soon learn lessons the hard way. When it's happened already, when young kids were picked up off the streets during student mobilizations and beaten black and blue, some were killed, some were wounded over the last few years. So the growth of the strong state is, is visible everywhere and it's a direct outcome of the system. It's a systemic, it's a result of the capitalist system today which doesn't actually want too much opposition. And you know, I have heard with my own ears Texan billionaires, oil billionaires, talking about how good the Chinese system is. And I, I was giving a talk in Iraq at Houston and I heard this af afterwards at a dinner. They were all against the war in Iraq, which was nice, but they said, you know, the Chinese don't have to bother with trade unions and all this. They just get on with their job and, you know, produce this stuff and look how well they're doing. So there are temptations along that route. I mentioned China because it's not just Europe and America now which dominate the world economically. The, the biggest and most important development of the 21st century has been that the center of the world market has shifted eastwards. And China is today the workshop of the world producing enormous amounts of goods. And if it carries on without a crash, which I'm not sure is going to be the case, I think the Chinese economy, according to all the economists, is getting overheated, according to Chinese economists. And there will be crashes, though because of heavy state presence in the economy, they can always pull some things back, so it will probably won't be worse. But it can't carry on like this. But even if it carries on, at half its existing capacity, what will be the price of German exports in five years' time, six years' time? The Chinese will be doing it all themselves. So these are things <clears throat> which need to be said and which need to be discussed. And the narcissists who have been running the European Union and the elites which dominate and rule Europe at the time have not been able to do it. I mean, I, it's very difficult to find, even within the right, you know, any single politician of vision. Europe, interestingly enough, was much more independent immediately after the Second World War. If you look back to the war in Vietnam, not a single Western European country participated in that war. Some could have, they didn't. They choose not to. In the 70s, during an American raid on some Arab country, I think it was Libya, the British government, conservative government, refused to allow British bases to be used for planes to take off on that bombing mission. The French did that same in the case of another uh, war. So, curiously enough, Western Europe was more independent at the time. What about Eastern Europe? Eastern Europe, the mythology now is as follows. The big problem that happened in Eastern Europe was a result of the Second World War, and the fact that it became part of the Soviet bloc. It's an it's a attractive mythology to the new elites in Eastern Europe, but there are a few other points which need to be made, which is that the differences between Eastern Europe and Western Europe go back to the days of the Roman Empire, if you read accounts. The West of Europe gained much more for a long, long time than the East. The East never developed a native feudal order from which urban developments grew and accrued by and large. Then you had the nomadic invasions. Then you had big empires which took the East, the uh, no, parts of the East, the Romanovs, 
the Austro, Austro-Hungarians, later the Germans, the Ottomans, four or five empires occupied parts of Eastern Europe. You can't just say it was linked to the Soviet Union after the Second World War. It wasn't. It's been a historic thing. So it was a great opportunity to unite Europe. I think I liked that side of it, to equalize, to try and equalize Eastern Europe and Western Europe. But the state of Eastern Europe has been, of the major countries of Eastern Europe, that after having been satellites, that was the common word of the Soviet Union since 1945, you would have thought that some of them, the new rulers, would like to be a bit independent of big powers. But they moved easily, without pausing for breath, to becoming uncritical satellites of the United States of America, backing its wars, sending troops to fight in them, Many of the dissidents of the Eastern Europe at the time became the pillars of new society. Václav Havel disturbed watching a wonderful opera in Prague and an aide whispers, the Americans have decided to uh, go to war in Iraq. What's our view? He says, we support it and carries on watching the opera. Adam Michnik, a whole layer of Polish intellectuals likewise. So Eastern Europe went in the other direction very quickly. And the Germans might be the biggest investors economically in many parts of Eastern Europe, which they are. But politically, the leaderships of Eastern Europe are dominated by American policy wonks and policy policies. And it is not the case that the bulk of the Polish people or the bulk of the Czech people supported these wars or wanted missile station. Every opinion poll showed that as far as popular opinion was concerned, Eastern European citizens were not so different from Western European citizens in opposing these wars. But they were ignored by the elites and were incapable of challenging them. And now the challenges are beginning to be seen. There have been demonstrations in the Czech Republic. There's been a huge student movement in Croatia, which was a very important student movement. It was one of the first student movements in Europe with very advanced progressive demands which were appreciated and admired in different parts of Europe. So a change, slow change, a perceptible change is visible. We can see it taking place, and one has to take that further. But in order to move further, we have to avoid a big problem that has happened under globalization, and that has happened especially within the European Union and the way it functions. It is that each particular small state which is part of the European Union, or even big states, have become provincialized. They are far less internationalist, far less engaged, far less interested in what's happening next door. Everything is seen through the optic of a big power, whether it's Germany in Europe or the United States globally. And lastly, one has to, at the very least, raise a question of who decides who should be in the European Union. The Russians can't be members of the European Union. Why not? The Turks can't be members of the European Union. Why not? Given the big decision by the United States to make the European Union so big and push for getting more and more members in, from their point of view to make Europe, you know, make a sort of neutralize it as a potential rival politically. They did that, but they did it very carefully. Though, to be fair, the Americans are in favor of Turkish entry into the European Union. On this, the Germans won't agree. But what about the Russians? Now, it could be argued that the new way of people joining the European Union 
which has been a pattern now since the Yugoslav war, is that first you join NATO, then we will see how you behave, and after you have been in NATO for some time, the next phase is membership of the European Union. That's what they did with Poland. That's what they, you know, when they expanded NATO to the outside Russia. The Russians actually said, we want to join NATO too. Please let us join NATO. But they were not allowed to do so. Why? Because they're too large a power? because they feel they can't be controlled, but that would be good if you think about it logically because it would create more space for debate and discussion within these organizations. It would not make these organizations like NATO a unilateralist organization which has to do, carry out a decision to go to war when the United States and Germany agree or the United States and France and Britain agree. That would be good, but it's not done. So even the way in which the European Union is organized today and who it lets in and who it keeps out is very revealing of the ideas and the thinking of the elites in Europe today. Now, it's not a pleasant picture. And the fact that these elites have proved incapable absolutely incapable of coming up with real solutions to the economic crisis, by which I mean solutions that benefit ordinary people, that benefit the majority of their own citizens. They have not been able to do that. So these elites clearly have to be replaced. They're not good. How are they to be replaced? This is a debate, again, which we started a few days ago and which people have been discussing. Can they only be replaced through parliamentary methods? So far, it seems to be the case. Because one of the lessons we have to learn or relearn is that it is possible to create alternative institutions. They have, after all, existed in history before. And I don't just mean during the Russian Revolution. I mean in Bolivia, in the 70s, when people were fighting for democracy, a tiny Andean country. They created a popular assembly where peasant leaders, representatives, trade unions, miners of all descriptions, sent elect and political parties sent delegates to this popular assembly to discuss the future of their country. I was really hoping that given the roadblocks in Greece and Spain, that this would be a possible direction in which the movements could be taken if they were blocked. Well, in Greece, Syriza broke through the blocks and moved, created a new atmosphere. Fine. In Spain, that hasn't happened as yet. But one has to rethink now the fight for popular institutions of popular sovereignty which isn't simply the existing parliament in the country. I say we have to think this because the way in which the European Union is going is going to make these parliaments more and more dysfunctional in the way in which real policies are being carried out. You know, I boarded a plane from Brussels where I was giving a talk to come to, to, to Zagreb. And the plane was packed with young school children from Croatia. And I asked one of the teachers, what were you doing? Why are so many of your kids? And they said, oh, we were on official EU trips to Brussels to see the European Parliament and to see the institutions of Europe. I said, what did you learn? I said, did you tell the kids that this European Parliament has no power at all? <laughs> and uh, the teacher who said, no, I didn't tell them that, I said, well, you know, it's a reality. You should have told them this is a Parliament. It looks very nice. It has quite a lot of money. Its members of Parliament are paid quite a lot, but they have no power at all. All the decisions are made in that little office called the Council of Ministers. And the Council of Ministers of the European uh, governments 
use this structure sometimes even to circumvent their own parliaments at home by taking decisions saying this is a European decision there's nothing we can do about it and ramming measures through their parliaments at home so sending children to learn what the institutions of Europe are in Brussels is much worse than dressing them up as young pioneers to sing songs on Tito's birthday at least that didn't harm anyone but the model is not so different, if you think about it. And where is it all going to take us? This, of course, is dependent on all of you, on us, on citizens, on the new generations that are rising and growing up and beginning to ask more and more questions of why this has happened, of what existed before it, or was everything bad that we argued for before? And how, in this age, we can move forward? Look, there are no certainties. One can't predict with certainty what is going to happen, except one thing, that the capitalist system is not capable of supplying the needs of a majority of people in the world today. And this affects everything. This affects any policies on the ecological level. People say, what will happen to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren and their great-great-children? Well, we don't know. It could be bad. Because the only way policies on the ecological front can be changed and reshaped is if there is some element of planning in society. Planning within states, interstate planning, planning on a global scale. Otherwise, how can anything effective be done on the ecological front, where turbocharged capitalism is destroying the ecology at a rapid rate? There's been a huge, huge increase in it. Carl Pugliani, in his very great work, uh, the, the Great Transformation, assumed when he was writing that book in the late 40s that the world could only move forward. He was a social socialist, a social democrat of Polish origin, lived in North America. Sorry, I stand corrected, a Hungarian. Uh, and a very, very important figure intellectually. And I think it's one of the best books to be written in that period about what would happen to the world unless this future got defined and in, unless the world moved more and more in that direction. Were he alive? You know, leave alone Marx. Were Pugliani alive? And to see the world today, it has regressed from what people like him thought at the time. And this is why the new movements that have arisen and the new generations that are coming into activity in times of grave social and economic crises will, of course, learn through their own experiences. And all I can say is that let's hope that the generations to come will avoid the mistakes that have been made by the left in the past will learn from those mistakes and will develop or struggle for a form of society which transcends both the existing capitalist order and the so-called socialisms that existed in the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. Thank you, Tarek, for the inspiring lecture again. Uh, now we have half an hour, I think, for questions from the audience. Just raise the hand, and here is one hand already, here in the first row. He was the fastest. Please uh, be short and pose questions and not comments, if you can. Yes. Um, 
I have a concrete question, but I don't know how the answer will be concrete. Um, um, when it comes to uh, free movement of goods, the free trade, and the uh, terrible conditions under which they are created, which ultimately affect the quality of life over here in Europe, uh, what is, in your opi opinion, the... Um, the outcome. Will the uh, European Union finally ironically colonize itself eventually in order to stay competitive on the market or do we put an embargo on, the, uh, on, the, on these products that are made under horrible conditions and are... And are well, uh, you can't put an embargo on anything that is produced at the moment in China or in India or places like that because the financial institutions will not let you do it. The World Trade Organization fights tooth and nail to stop uh, any embargoes on that. Uh, so that, I don't think, uh, is going to work. Though I will say this, that if a country or a region decides to change course and defy the financial institutions and the big powers, they can do many, many things. What do I mean when I talk about regions? Look, in Europe, it serves the needs of the big European countries. Let's just talk about Europe for a minute, to have tiny little states which they can dominate. Let's, let's be blunt. What are these states? They are de facto colonies. It's a rude word, but they are. You know, Croatia, Serbia, colonies, EU colonies, Bosnia, Kosovo, protectorates, officially protectorates till now. So wouldn't it make more sense to think again, not to recreate the old Yugoslavia or go for Yugostalgia or anything like that, but to think what would create a strong region in this area which would be able to struggle for its interests and the interests of its people effectively, even within the structures of the European Union. I'm not advocating they walk out of the European Union. I think a Balkan confederation which includes all the former Yugoslav republics, as well as Greece, as well as Bulgaria, as well as Albania, is, is something which should be considered. It's in the interests of all of them. The Greeks, or the Greek elite used to say, and they're still saying, by the way, how can we leave the euro? Because this is what has made us European. If it takes a piece of paper to make you European, then you're in a very sad state indeed. And if we give up this piece of paper, we will be like the third world, they say. They don't want to say Africans because it's a bit rude. Though some extreme right people say that. Uh, but they say we will be like the third world. But this is complete nonsense. You know, this is to accept fate. So I think what you suggest is possible only if you have large blocks within Europe. I just don't want to mention the, I mention the Balkan Federation because I'm here. You can have a Northern European bloc too, uh, of the Scandinavians and independent Scotland and Ireland, or if the English want to come in, though they won't because they're so closely attached. You know, if you, yeah, I don't want to be rude now, but uh, they're so closely attached to the United States that they can't think of anything else. That is their primary affiliation, not to the European Union, but to the Atlant Atlant across the Atlantic. So we are now in a situation of turbulence, and we have to think bravely and boldly. And I think a Balkan confederation, economically, politically, socially, culturally, is a good idea. It will be attacked because many of the elites, it's not in their interest. But it is in the interest of the common people, and then it can something like these issues being raised, can be done. The other thing is this, that in these countries which produce goods in horrible conditions, what we have to really struggle for, we, not, you know, we can struggle for it in the abstract by writing about it and arguing in its favor, but what the people of these countries have to do and struggle for is trade union rights, rights of self-organization, so they can defend their own interests. They do it, but they are crushed. 
They do it in India, but you have such a large reserve pool of labor that it becomes difficult. Uh, in China, it's not allowed. You're not allowed to, you know, I mean, their trade unions are official bodies which are attached to the, the state. That would be the most effective way of uh, improving conditions. And people who get worked up, you know, sometimes about immigration, by the way, they never understand why people migrate. You know, why did a million Greeks migrate to Australia? Why? Why did Germans in the mid-19th century migrate to the United States? There are always reasons, economic reasons, for it. And unless the world is improved as a whole economically, you will always have migrations from poor countries to rich countries where people try and find work. I mean, there are many, many people, Croats, Serbs, etc., also in Australia, by the way. They left for, many of them left for political reasons. They didn't like the new Yugoslavia. And they took their politics there with them. Uh, <clears throat> but some went for purely economic reasons. So the answer to your question is that it's not something we can achieve immediately, but it has to be fought for on many different levels, both in Europe and in countries like China and India. There is another question, and can you please raise your hands if there are other ones? Yeah, in the upper part of cinema. Um, I have a question for you. You just to criticize basically capitalism on various aspects, and I pretty much agree with everything you said. We have a lack of democratic, um, we have actually a democratic deficit in Europe and lack of accountability when decisions are made on the top of the European Union. But at the same time, this um, more extreme types of socialisms can be easily criticized, especially in the South America. We have Venezuela, where is also <laughs> the question and uh, the legitimacy of the decision very questionable, and also it's a just illusionary democracy of the people. What I'm all more interested in is, of course, you said that um, Hayek, if I'm right, mentioned at the beginning that his platform was to stay within the economic union, but just practically to stay politically independent. And it reminded me on the example of Switzerland. And I'm actually asking you what we can learn from there. Because in Switzerland, we have a country which is part of economic union, but it's politically completely, in a sense, independent. And there is actually the best type of democracy that we now have in Europe because people are asked every time on everything there. So people participate all the time. They're part of an economic union. And which is very important is that Switzerland today has very strong social component, very strong redistributional mechanisms. And people there live pretty well, I think. So do you think that this is an example we can learn from? And I mean, it's a, and you, I will mention one more time that still Switzerland is a capitalistic country, the country that did not experience the same failures that most of the countries in the EU had. Uh, the first response I would make is I disagree with you very fundamentally about South America. I have been there many, many times myself, so I don't even talk from in an abstract way and seen with my own eyes what has changed and what hasn't changed in those countries. They shouldn't be idealized, but what has happened in South America is being noticed and commented on by everyone. It's not illusory democracy. It's a very real democracy. When Chavez gave, when the Bolivarians in Venezuela had a new constitution, the oligarchic elite opposed it. We don't want it. It was voted through with a majority, large majority. Then they used that same democratic constitution to try and overthrow, to try and get enough signatures to have a recall vote. It's the only constitution in the in the world which permits a certain number of signatories of citizens to say we want new elections. New elections. And the same opposition that had refused to vote for the Constitution now used it to demand new elections. And they had them. They got enough signatures. And there were new elections. And the Americans sent many people to observe these elections, which they never do in Saudi Arabia, by the way. 
They sent people to observe these elections. Jimmy Carter is Center for Human Rights. And Carter said publicly after these elections, these are the freest elections I have ever seen, he said. Which, by which I mean he included in his own country, because after all, he was elected president too. So it's, it's the, the campaign of vilification against the South Americans was so strong. Why is it that every single mainstream newspaper in Europe wrote exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing about these countries, especially the Venezuelans because they had oil money? Exactly the same thing. That's democracy. You, whether you read The Guardian or The Financial Times or The Economist or El Pais, which was particularly vicious, or Le Monde, which was equally vicious, with the exception, I have to say, of the German press that was more balanced, the rest and the American press, exactly the same thing as if one central office was churning all this stuff out and they were putting different glosses on it and publishing it. And the reason they were nervous is that these people were challenging the neoliberal system. I give you, forget Venezuela. A Spanish company in, uh, in, in Argentina is about to go under. The Spanish owners of that company are negotiating with the Chinese to buy the company. The government of Christina Kirchner finds out what the Chinese are going to pay. She doesn't want a foreign country to have this anymore. She finds out exactly what the Chinese have offered. The Chinese tell them. And they nationalize the company and give compensation, which is exactly the same as the Chinese were about to pay them. And the Spanish government goes berserk. This is dictatorial. This is authoritarian. Then a week later, Evo Morales does exactly the same thing in Bolivia. Now, I call that rather exciting, actually, that these countries are not, they don't have to ring up the Treasury Department in Washington or the chancellery in Berlin and say, excuse me, could you mind if we do this? No, they do it. That's what I call sovereignty, and that's what I call independence. Look, Switzerland is a tiny country, you know, an absolutely tiny country with very uh, interesting but also peculiar uh, customs, which has survived largely as a banking haven for uh, criminals and uh, politicians of every time. What is the basis of Swiss wealth? It is their banking system, a banking system which is totally thrived on secrecy, which means that, you know, anyone can have their <clears throat> money there. This is not some beautiful El Dorado which can be repeated here, and it's a deeply reactionary country on many levels in the way they operate, in the way they think, in the way they treat uh, 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 immigrants, in the way they prevent, you know, through manipulated referenda by big, big campaigns to stop even a mosque being built. In, in the country. You can say it's democratic because a majority of people voted it. You know, if you, if you whip up a hate campaign against a minority and then the next after that in which the minority has very few rights and can't argue its case on television and the newspapers and then people vote in a prejudiced way, on that basis you would get votes for capital punishment all over Europe, in parts of Europe and you would get votes for expelling migrants and locking up Muslims and, you know, shaving the hair of women who wear the hijab and God knows what in some areas, not in all areas. So I don't take Swiss, Switzerland very seriously. And you know, I always, I said this in Switzerland to Swiss politicians once when there was a conference that, and there were people openly attacking African immigrants. And there were three Africans in the audience, they were totally sort of pure white, the three Africans and me. And I was on the platform with the Minister for Immigration talking absolute nonsense. So ultimately, I couldn't talk seriously because the whole thing was surreal. And I turned to the Swiss minister and said, a country like you, which apart from banking, has earned so much money from chocolate, why do you hate that color so much? <laughs> And her only response was, you are going too far. And I said, no, no, you don't know me. I'm, this is just a joke. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there is another question. And then on the right part of the upper part of the cinema. 
Okay, um, thank you for the very inspiring talk. Um, Where are you? Can you stand up? Uh, sorry, okay. I can't. Ah, okay. Yeah, Hi. I'm rather small, so I will stand up. Okay. Um, as they say, uh, it is somewhat easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, so thank you for kind of bringing this, uh, this other end um, somewhat closer to us. I want to ask you a rather abstract question and thus you are free to interpret it in whichever way you wish. Mm -hmm. um, if capitalism really ends or if capitalism really were to end, would this by default constitute a victory for socialism? And if yes, for what kind of socialism and where? And if not, where do you see other challenges for socialism coming from? In the first place, capitalism will not come to an end automatically. That will never, never happen. It will only happen if there is an alternative, an anti-capitalist, broad, socialist, anti-democratic, anti-capitalist alternative that is visible to people, that people trust, and say, okay, this system is crushing us, we have had bad experiences before, but let's try it again. That is the only time capitalism will end. Look, it's existed now. There are debates within academic uh, economists and historians, social historians, as to how long capitalism has, has existed. But let's say at the very least the middle of the medieval period when it was born, uh, as we know it, in uh, the Low Countries, in Holland and in Belgium, and then spread to the rest of the world. So it has been with us for many, many, many centuries. And only one conscious attempt was made to provide an alternative by the Bolsheviks in Russia. Eternal glory to them, I say, that they tried it. Eternal glory to the Bolsheviks. <clears throat> They, they had the guts and the courage to try it. They failed, or their successors failed, and the reasons they failed were objective. As the, when I read out to you, or my interpretation of what Marx had called for, that socialism can only really happen in societies of abundance. From that point of view, the country where, which were ready, if you like, for socialism were Britain, were the United States, were the Germans in the, in, 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 in before the Russians, long, long before the Russians. Even the Italians, the French, though they were largely still peasant nations, they were less peasant than Russia was. The productive forces were much, much more developed. And to be fair to the poor Bolshevik leaders, they were very nervous. They took power because they said no one else can run this country. And you know the choice in Russia in 1917 was not choice between the wicked, evil, cruel Bolsheviks and nice Swedish-style social democrats. The choice was between the Bolsheviks and a form of Russian anti-Semitic fascism backed by the military and backed by the Black Hundreds. Those were the choices because the people in the middle had failed. And if you, if you look at the writings of the early Bolshevik leaders, they are saying, praying almost, though they're not religious people, for a German revolution. They're saying, without a revolution in Germany, we are sunk. How long can we retain state power is the title of one of Lenin's pamphlets. Because they were deeply aware of the economic system, of the political system, and how if they were isolated, it was the beginning of the end. And isolated they were, and with a vengeance. And that isolation was not really broken till the Second World War, but by that time the system that had been created was such an abomination that uh, people fought for Mother Russia, not for the system. Most people did. But at the same time, this I say to those who equate fascism and Nazism today, including in this country where I'm told this weekend there was a ceremony in church 
in honor of her ustash leader, Ante Pavlovich. I think that's a total and complete disgrace to the memory of the partisans of the former Yugoslavia who fought against fascism. But it's, uh, you know, it happens in many other parts. Many French intellectuals come up with the same nonsense. It isn't the same. They were not. They were two completely different enterprises. And without, you know, where would Europe be today? I ask you, think about it. Where would Europe be today without the Red Army that won the battles of Kursk and Stalingrad? Where would Europe be today without the communist partisans of Yugoslavia, of Greece, of France, of Italy? The Americans were convinced that Germany was going to win the war. At one point, they said to the English, send us your fleet so at least we can keep something for you. <laughs> no one expected the Russians to turn the German tide back. That is, you know, 30 million Russians died in the Second World War. And one shouldn't forget that in these days of bland equations of everything's the same. Yes, the Stalinists were authoritarians. Yes, we attacked them, but we don't equate them with the people they fought against or had to fight against, and that's extremely important. So to come back to your question, capitalism will go when something emerges, which we all hope will be very different of what emerged before because the world has changed and the world continues to change, and it offers an alternative which is not just a vision of a better society, but which in the struggle for the better society begins to demonstrate it. Yeah, there's another question. Uh, I have a question regarding your remark that you made. So uh, it was about that the German political decision to recognize Slovenia and Croatia during the conflict in ex Yugoslavia in 91 was uh, like external trigger for the war. So I wonder, because I, at the time I was 12, so I was, I was, since then I'm, sl I'm still trying to figure out what, what went here. <laughs> and my answer currently is that actually the local elites were responsible for the war. They wanted it. So are they, and if, I mean, I don't think that Germany triggered anything. So, but I, I would like to know just the external point of view. Thanks. Um, look, obviously it was a combination of both. There were, there were layers of the nationalist elites which were turning towards nationalism very viciously in Serbia and Croatia, in my opinion, uh, who, who were at, for quite a long time moving in that direction. What I'm saying is that the European Union could have prevented it, the breakup. How? What were the external factors? The Germans thinking after the collapse of communism of the Soviet Union, they were ready to flex their muscles again. This was an old area they knew well. Uh, and these were states, after all, where they had been before. You know, as an imperial power, forget the Third Reich, as an imperial power, German imperial power, they had been here before, and they thought they could get them quickly. And... We still haven't read all the papers within the German, you know, some we know because Oscar Lafontaine, after he resigned as the second leader of the SPD, said at a May Day meeting in Berlin, one big self-criticism we have to make is for what we did to Yugoslavia. So they know what they did. There were external factors. It wasn't just bad Balkan people fighting each other. Why, you know, they didn't, they don't. It's crazy to think that. It's sort of self-flagellatory. It could have been stopped. The second external factor were the IMF conditions and the IMF demands placed on a unified Yugoslavia for what they called structural reforms, i.e., which meant massive cutbacks, the Yugoslav army couldn't be paid, and of course people began to get nervous. And it's at this particular time, at this conjuncture, that you had the turn of the old communist leaders towards nationalism, uh, Milosevic, uh, 
in, 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 in Serbia and Tuđman in Croatia. They were both former communists. Now they were both rogues as far as I'm concerned. And that Feral Tribune cover produced in Croatia showing them in bed with each other was a very good one. Uh, at that particular time. But one can't just blame them. They were helped by, by uh, external forces. How could the EU have prevented it? I tell you very simply, by stopping the IMF from doing what it did and by offering a huge loan to a unified Yugoslavia, of course they could have made conditions. You know, you must give the Kosovans the same status as the other states have, and no one state should be that dominant. All these safeguards could be put in, but at the top of it, here's $20 billion which to, to rebuild the country after the depredations of the IMF. Uh, I think it probably would have worked. It would have worked, because these elites were not that powerful at that time. They were elites in formation. But they didn't do it. Anyway, we've learned the lessons, I hope, from that uh, uh, particular disaster, because it was an ugly civil war, and it was a civil war. And horrible things happened in Bosnia, which we all know about, and in the Kraina, not far from Split. And one interesting thing happened which surprised me, because when Belgrade was bombed, by NATO, many of us were really worried as what might happen to the Albanians living in Belgrade. You know, for obvious reasons, that people get angry and turn on the other. Very interesting. There were very few incidents. The Albanian quarters in Belgrade were not touched. There were no lynch mobs. There were no crowds rushing to destroy them or beat them up or burn their cafes. That did not happen. And that is quite an astonishing event. It's one of the good things that Belgrade more or less preserved its character. There were a few incidents, but very, very minor. So that too is something from which lessons can be learned. Thank you, Tariq. <clears throat> But there is another question if you want to answer or, yeah, this, this would be the last question then. And then we will get a big applause for Tariq. Thank you. I agree with you. Znači, taj rat nije vođen u Srbiji i prema tome, uz pomoć petih kolona, oni su, oni su napale druge zemlje, napravili su naprije ovaj, pobune i tako dalje. Druga stvar što se tiče, kažete, nije bilo rušenja nikakvi albanski četvrti i, i u Beogradu. Pa naravno, zašto bi oni ručili ono što je u nju u srcu, u samom srcu Srbije? Ono, njima je smetalo Kosovo kao, kao izvan oni koji su odcijepili. I to je meni bezazno tvrđenje da oni su trebali rušiti albanske četvrti u samom Beogradu gdje je njihovo srce i vlast i svega ostaloga i bez je stvari. Druga stvar, što se tiče sami te Jugoslavije, na neki način koje vi je zločinačke torevne, koje vi zagorate, to je biti i masonska torevina i od prvog i drugog svjetskog rata, a ako tome ne vrijete, čitajte Svetuna Vacuna, engleskog agenta, pa ćete puno više o tome doznat. Hvala lijepa. You know, thank you very much for saying what you did, because otherwise I would go back with a very strange opinion that we are all in agreement with each other. <laughs> and I know that is not the case, so I'm glad you said what you did. I don't want to repeat what I said uh, uh, before, but I just want to urge you that it is important sometimes when horrible things have happened when crimes have been committed by all sides, not by one side, to at least try and understand how this happened 
and how in some areas people who had been living with each other for a long, long time turned on each other, killed each other. It's not the only part of the world where it's happened. It happened in India and Pakistan in 1947 when the partition was decided on. This is the logic of all partitions. You decide to partition a country on the basis of ethnicity or religion, which is what in, the British did in India and Pakistan, backed by some local people. Of course, it's always the case. And the city I was born in, Lahore, as I was growing up, all my life I would hear my parents when they were driving around the city mentioning, remember, as we went through streets, look at that house, X used to live here, Y used to live here. They were Muslim, uh, they were Hindus and Sikhs who had been driven out of the city, like many Muslims were driven out of Delhi. And my parents' generation never forgot that. And they told me a story that one guy who went completely crazy, had many, many Hindu and Sikh friends and started killing them. And later on, after it all ended, he said, I don't know why I did that. I was just caught up in a crazed thing and he committed suicide. Just couldn't live with himself anymore for doing it. So when <coughs> people's land, their houses, their whole lives are threatened with big cataclysmic upheavals, they are capable of doing awful things to each other. And it would be sad if all we could say after these events is they did what they had to do. I don't believe that. That is not my way of looking at the world. I think that when you divide on partitions, I mean, look at the state of Bosnia today. Divided into three bits. The Republic of Srpska, whose great president now wants to join the European Union. He's just discovered this is a new route. Let me join the... Look, the Republic of Srpska will join the European Union. Okay. <laughs> join it. But that doesn't solve the problems on the ground in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which used to be a society where people did live together for a long, long time. No one, I, I remember when I used to come to Yugoslavia, no one even used to talk about Muslims or Christians or Orthodox or Catholics. I mean, some did, but very few. So things change and you begin to think differently and think it's necessary that this had to happen because it was inevitable. I don't believe that. I don't believe it was inevitable, which is why I argued quite carefully that we need to reunite this region in some new shape and form and more democratically than before to strengthen the region as a whole and to try and write off and draw a line under what happened here during, I repeat, a nasty and unpleasant civil war. Thanks.